Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Create a Balanced College List. I am Roxana, and I am here with Jenny. And we are going to go through um, in about 25 minutes just talking specifically about college lists and what types of statistics and numbers and data we can get to try to figure out um, you know, how a student's list can be balanced. Um, we'll talk about what we mean by balance. We'll talk about different places to look and information to gather. And then at the end, we'll actually go through a student so you can see a little bit um, in terms of how, to, how we balanced out the list and how the student kind of went through the process. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. So here we go. There we go. All right. So like I said, we're going to talk about developing the college list. If your student is currently a junior, you're in this process right now. If your student is a freshman or a sophomore, these are just some of the things to start to think about um, as you start to look towards building a college list. Uh, we'll talk about factors which will help create balance and why balance is important in the list. And then really talking about creating a well-rounded college list to maximize options. In the end, a student can only go to one school, but we want to make sure it's really our goal that students have choices. And so a lot of the choices come when students have a really well-balanced list. So in our previous presentations, we talked about our initial research and our secondary research um, and really focusing on the students' college values and majors and activities and ways to kind of research colleges. So once we get past that initial and secondary research, we're really focusing on balancing that college list. And what we mean by balance is thinking about your college list in terms of the selectivity of the schools, what are their acceptance rates, how many students do they often take versus how many applicants they have. Um, we may look at balance in terms of school sizes. Do we have both small schools and large schools and, or mid-sized schools in case students change their mind midway through their senior year about what their ideal school looks like. Um, we may balance in terms of being in state and out of state. We may balance by cost and we definitely balance by probability of acceptance. So that's what we mean by balance, kind of looking at that list and weighing out all of those options and that's what we're focusing on tonight. So there's a lot of different things that go in in terms of a school's selectivity um, and thinking about what's important to them. Uh, there is a site that we use called Big Future that's actually put out by the College Board that can be really helpful in helping students understand sort of what's important to the school in terms of the application and then also getting a really good sense of what the school is looking for um, in terms of their average SAT and ACT scores, what their acceptance rate is, and all of those types of things. Um, what Jenny so graciously pulled here um, is looking at, I believe it's the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, when you click on the tab of applying, um, which you see in the top left, it gives you those details in terms of what's important. Um, and what Washington is saying is incredibly important to them, right? They have a choice. They fill out a form every year about what is very important, important, considered, and not important. And what they have determined as the three most important things um, in, this, in their application process is the GPA, the essay, and the rigor of the secondary school record. Um, so rigor of secondary school record is really a fancy way of saying transcript. Um, so they're really looking at the classes that you're taking and the grades that you're getting. Um, then on the right hand side, colleges have an option to um, to show or to tell what they want to say in terms of how they review applications. And what's important to the University of Washington is that applicants are holistically reviewed. You'll hear this a lot. What that means is that they're not looking for any one factor. They're not creating um, 
a composite number based off of taking the GPA and multiplying it by test scores or anything like that. They really are looking at everything and you see that by them determining that actually the application essay is very important. There's a lot of schools where application essay will not end up in that very important box. Um, so it's important to kind of know what schools are looking for when you're starting to determine how do you fit? Is this going to be something that's in a target range? Is this something that's going to be a safety? Um, you see at the top, um, next to the applying box, it says very selective. So 46% of applicants admitted. And one of the important things to think about with University of Washington is that's their overall acceptance rate. So that is both in-state and out-of-state students. Um, it can be very difficult to find out-of-state admit rates for colleges. Um, and in this particular case, that's actually really important. So we have, might have to dig a little further to see um, in terms of selectivity, they're slightly more selective for their out-of-state students than they are um, for their in-state students. So where all of that information comes from is something called the common data set. Now, anybody, every school has to do the common data set. I think it's now required that they all have it available um, basically on their website. And so we really recommend that students go and look at this common data set to gather all sorts of information because this is coming straight from the college. What you'll see is that a lot of the things, right, the exact things that are on the common data set get replicated on other websites. This is the, this is the data that they're pulling from. Um, but for families that like numbers, for kids who like to, you know, really look into colleges and get an in-depth picture of, you know, how many students are majoring and graduating with particular majors, um, you know, really specifically the breakdowns of different types of factors, um, this is a great thing to look at. Recommendation is that you literally, whatever school that you're looking at, um, whatever school you want to look at, you basically, you want to Google the school's name and common data set and find the most recent. And it will come up and they're all in the same, there's, um, it's like A through F in terms of sections. Um, you'll get to know what the different sections are. It's pretty easy to go through. But what we see on this particular slide, uh, which is for University of Washington, you'll see this is where they got the information um, on Big Future. The rigor of the secondary school report, academic GPA and application essay, right, are incredibly important. Now, the interesting thing is, is then we look over and test scores actually fall into the important category. So this may be a discrepancy between which year they're looking at. Um, but essentially, um, I took a th student through this today um, and she found it really fascinating just to get a better sense of what schools are looking for. They're actually being relatively transparent. So then after you kind of look at that um, common data set, you can also look on the college's website to determine their academic, academic profile. Typically colleges will post their um, freshman admission profile from the year before and tell you the average high school GPA, the average test scores, and what was important um, in terms of the, the application process as well. They'll give you a breakdown of demographics of enrolled freshmen. They may even, like University of Washington here, provides uh, direct admits to, uh, to different colleges and for engineering students. All of that information is listed there. In the red box, you see they give you a breakdown of all of the admits, Washington residents, and U.S. non-residents and international students. They kind of break it down by sections of the average GPAs, the average test scores, and um, when you're looking at these averages, it's really important to recognize that you know, the 3.71 GPA is, you know, right at the bell curve, right? So that's the mid 50%. And the 3.96 is the top 25%. Um, so 25% of the students who applied and were admitted actually had a 3.96 and above, right? 25% of students uh, who were admitted had a 3.71 
below a 3.71. So this is that mid 50% of the applicants. Just important to note, note that that's a range. So while it's good to look at these factors, it's also really important and really um, a good thing for you to go over with your counselor where you fall, because that's going to help us determine whether or not uh, this is the right academic fit for you overall if you're applying and the University of Washington's on your list. So, and then this is just the UC academic profile. If you go on the UC's website and Google admissions profile for any of their campuses, they're very transparent about what the statistics look like. So the overall admit rate for Berkeley last year was 14.9%. The average GPA, again, that mid 50%, like I talked about with the bell curve, um, was listed there as a 4.16 to 4.30 and then they have the average test scores there. You'll see a lot with the UCs, they talk about their 14-point comprehensive review. These three factors determine your academic fit, but then the overall fit to the UCs, they're going to look at 14 different factors in their review of your application to see how you match up. And that's rigor of coursework, that's your activities, those are your application essays, and then special projects, any education educational prep programs, and the list goes on. If you click on that green link, it'll take you to what they review. So you can just see that the UC academic profile and comprehensive review is a little bit different than what University of Washington publishes. And I think it's important to note too that these are some of the basic numbers that are really helpful, I think, for students and families to be looking at and that we're having students try to gather this information because overall admit rate is important. Um, the average SAT and ACT scores, these are the numerical things that we actually can get, right? There's a lot of this process that does not boil down into specific numbers. So this is the place that we start because we actually can get numbers for these things and we can line them up against a student's numbers. So that um, makes it super helpful. But you know, like the UCs, there's another 11 points of things that they're looking at. <laughs> you know, like the University of Washington, what you, you know, what you notice was there and not there, the essay is incredibly important, but the activities did not make it right into the most important category. So it's starting to just kind of see that individual students are going to be viewed differently by different colleges. All right, so this is what this is what families are always looking for, right? And this is this is kind of like what we really want students to be um, thinking about when they're building their college list is we want them to have what we consider likely schools, target schools, and reach schools. And then actually there is going to be um, there's an additional category, which is lottery, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so once you've started to look through all of the, you know, the acceptance rate and all of the numbers, and the students are also simultaneously trying to figure out what's really important to them and what are schools that fit them really well. Then as counselors, we start to separate the schools out into these different um, categories. So in our mind, a likely is a place where a student's academic profile is significantly higher than the middle 50% of students admitted to the college. So like when we looked at University of Washington, we're looking to determine, does the student have those numbers that we talked about and that they are higher than the middle 50% of the students? The other thing that we really have to consider when we're thinking about, you know, whether it's a likely a target or a reach is what is the acceptance rate overall, right? So if a student it has a 4.3, right, and they, um, they are, you know, over the middle 50th percentile of everything that we find for Northwestern, but Northwestern has an admit rate that's less than 12%, it's not going to be a likely. Right? So there's a couple of different things that we have to look at in terms of counselors and we want families to be really aware of that it's not just the student's profile, we also have to be really looking at um, the school's profile as well. 
Um, a target, it means you're right in there. You're in that middle 50th percentile for um, SAT or ACT. Your grades are in that range. Um, and again, that the, that, the, that the college has an acceptance rate of 40 to 60%. For some super high achieving kids, it might be 35 or 30% as well. Um, it really does depend on the student, but we're looking for the, and target means, you know what, we call it a 50-50, right? With that, you know, we think that you'll probably get into about 50% of your target schools, um, or that's our hope if we've really balanced the list. Um, and then a reach is where that middle 50th percentile is above where the student currently stands. Um, and then, you know, any student that has an accept, any, pardon me, any college that has an acceptance rate that's lower than 30%, oftentimes is just going to be in the reach category because that's the only option. Um, there's also a lot of other factors that go into the application and this is the time of the year that we start to talk to students about the things that they can control that are part of their application and the things that they can't control. Right, so in terms of things that they can control, um, they can control their GPA to a point, um, they can control their test scores to a point, um, but that there's other things that are determining things like likely target and reach. Uh, there are some schools where it's really important that students demonstrate interest. And that means that students who don't demonstrate interest are less likely to be accepted to that school, regardless of their profile, right? So a lot of colleges are concerned about their yield. They do not want to accept kids that they think don't want to go there. So there's sometimes situations where students have something that looks like a target or even a likely, and they end up not getting admitted because the school doesn't think they're gonna come. So there's a little bit of making sure that everything on the list is something that students are excited about and that if, a, if demonstrated interest is important, that students are doing it. Um, other factors might be, you know, how many students from your school are applying, right? So if, you know, five students from your school are applying ED Duke and you are all qualified, you're not all gonna get in. It's just not gonna happen, but that is completely out of your control. We also don't know if Stanford is looking for kids who are really good at improv, that some, you know, one of the, one of the clubs needs something or that they need a trombone player or a fencer or, you know, we don't know those things. And so what we talk to students about is when you balance a list, you have to understand that there's probably 40% of this process that you have Zippo control over, right? Which is really uncomfortable, but it really helps to know that everybody's in the same space here um, in terms of not, you know, you, you're not controlling your gender, you're not controlling the high school that you come from. Um, and then some of the other factors that the school has determined as their institutional priorities for that year, we're not gonna know what they are. Lottery schools, my favorite. <laughs> Everybody loves lottery schools. Um, so basically, lottery schools have sort of less than a 15% acceptance rate. Um, you'll have, you know, Stanford has a 4% acceptance rate. Um, the Ivies, a lot of them are in that 4 to 7% acceptance rate. We call them lotteries because we have no idea whether a student is going to get in or not um, because of all those factors I just talked about in the previous slide. They are getting so many students that are academically qualified, right, that they, they need to go to the next level of selectivity, right? They are turning away, you know, at one point I read something that, you know, Stanford turned away 500 students that had perfect SAT scores. Um, I just put something on our blog that was um, a post um, called 805 because there's another, you know, selective Ivy that turned away 805 valedictorians, right? You have to remember how many high schools there are in the U.S., how many valedictorians there are. There's tons of kids with perfect SAT scores, and those kids are getting denied, right? Because the schools can go to their next round of priorities in terms of what's important to them um, in building a class. Um, a lot of the schools that have this type of selectivity are looking for a point of excellence. And what that means is it's something on a local, national, or international scale. Um, if you tuned in um, to our letters of recommendation, uh, which I highly recommend uh, listening to if you haven't, when recommenders fill out those recommendations, the students that are getting into these schools are getting the marks of, this is one of the best students I've ever seen in my career. 
And that's how selective things are. And again, we're never going to know if they need a trombone player or an amazing journalist or that they want someone who's fluent in five languages. Um, that's why they're lotteries. Some of the kids are going to get in. They do every year. We just, it's really hard to determine. And we also really counsel kids not to have too many lottery schools because they are a lot of work. And by having to do all of that application, all of those applications, they're taking away their time and energy from schools um, that are a little bit more predictable. So one of the things that we wanted to cover too was that in order to see where you fall in the context of your high school, which is how students are being evaluated, that using Naviance is an excellent tool for this, especially juniors right now where you have, you know, a pretty solid GPA. Um, you may have taken the SAT or ACT one time or two times at this point. So you can kind of see where you fall in the context of your school. This Naviance sc scattergram, this is called a scattergram and everybody has access to these um, through Naviance. It's just kind of, it's, sometimes it's a little bit hard to find them, but I'm going to walk you through how to do that. Um, this is a breakdown of a, a student who was applying to UC Davis and all of the other students who applied to UC Davis from her school over the past three to five years, right? So what you're going to do is log into Naviance and add um, any college onto your colleges I'm thinking about list. When you do that, you can click on a section that's called Scattergram, and then you're going to change the GPA and test score to fit whatever your school reports it as. So if it's a weighted GPA or unweighted GPA, and then whether or not you took the SAT or ACT to see kind of how you compare. The red arrow there indicates that you as a student, so you're like a little blue head with a circle. And then the green check marks are all of the students who have been admitted. The X's are students who have been denied. And then I believe the purplish um, colors are either waitlist or um, you know maybe early decision things like that. So well I guess this is UC Davis, so it wouldn't be early decision. So you see that this blue head falls more amongst the green checks. So um, here in the top, it says that this is a student that have many, many people who apply to UC Davis, um, that she has a 4.0 and her likelihood of admission looks pretty good. If you're in among the green check marks, it means that you have a pretty good probability. So on the left of the scattergram, it, it shows the GPA and the bottom of the scattergram shows the SAT score. So you see that students from her school, the ones who scored 14 1,500 and above and had, you know, above a 4.0 GPA fared pretty well at Davis. But again, like Roxana mentioned earlier, if you have 250 students from your high school applying to UC Davis that are all qualified, probably most likely all 250 students are not going to get in from your high school. So while this is a good rule of thumb and a good measure to kind of see where you fall, it's not the only factor. Um, if your students um, or you can't figure out how to get to the scattergrams on Naviance, just ping us. Um, we can help you do that, or we, we can show the students in the, sec in the session. Um, they've made it a little bit harder to find than it has been in the past, right. so, um, and they um, are kind of constantly changing their interface, so we're, we're happy to do that. The nice thing about this Naviance scattergram is that it's, it's considered in context, right? It's in the context of your school, so the data is very relevant. So now is the point in time where we're kind of going to walk through a, a sample student. Um, we're going to look at the academic factors, weighted, unweighted GPA test scores, rigor of schedule, and the major. And the academic profile of this student is as follows. So um, he went to a public high school. His weighted GPA was a 3.8. His unweighted was a 3.5. His highest test score was a 1440 on the SAT. And I think rigor is a really important thing to kind of look at as well. So the rigor of his junior year, he had four honors and one AP course. And then, and then obviously some regular um, college prep courses. And then in his senior year, he had two APs uh, in his senior year as well. 
He was looking for a major of business or marketing, and his top college values were really, he wanted some in-state options mostly. He wanted to stay in California. He wanted some good sports um, teams to follow, wanted to be near beaches or the coast, and he wanted also a social environment. So those were his, his top factors. So as we built his college list, the schools on the left were where we kind of were in limbo before we had our parent appointment in August. So there were too many schools on the list. There was about 17. So we really needed to kind of like knock some schools off of there. Two schools were lottery. So um, we got rid of one of those. So we got UCLA off the list. Two schools were too expensive. And then there were two schools that were just too small for his taste. Um, so when we were getting rid of these schools, the other thing that we kind of looked at in terms of balance was that he had similar schools on his list. Like University of San Diego was pretty similar to what Loyola Marymount offered. So we kind of pinned those two up together and he decided, look, I'll take off University of San Diego. Um, UCLA and USC were both lottery. So he decided, I'll take UCLA off because we don't need, to, I didn't want to, he didn't want to do, um, add UCLA to the list either. And then he had some state schools that were safe options. So we took off San Francisco State. And then Occidental and Pepperdine were just a little too small for his taste. So that's how we narrowed it down um, to 11 schools. Is that right? The math. <laughs> Hopefully it's right. <laughs> Which is where we kind of came out and then we looked at it and balanced the list by academic fit, which Roxanne is going to walk you through. All right. So the first part of balancing it, again, is sort of that academic fit. And then we're going to go through some other, other exercises that we do with students to kind of make sure that it's balanced in the way that they want. Um, so what we're looking at, you know, students should have one to three likely schools. Now, if they have one likely that they're super excited about and it's rolling admissions or early action and we can get that information early, awesome. You can leave it at one. Um, but for a lot of students, this category oftentimes comes with money um, or some type of, of academic scholarship. And so sometimes students wanna have a few more of the likely categories. So when we look at, you know, the profile of the student is at the bottom of the slide, right? And when we look at the stats for San Jose State, um, San Jose State, pretty predictable. If you get, you know, if it's your local um, state school, um, which it is for a lot of our students, um, and you're above a 3.0 and you meet um, the SAT threshold, you're in, which is great. Um, and then you see University of Oregon, um, you know, still the GPA, his GPA was higher and it looks pretty good. Target is where I would say the majority of, you know, the big part of the list should be. And we're looking at four to five schools. Um, in terms of um, the ones going through, you see the ones Chapman, LMU, San Diego State, and UC Santa Cruz are all sort of in that target range. Reaches anywhere from one to three. Um, I will say that, um, and I think Jenny does this too, I'm never going to tell a kid that they can't apply to a particular reach school or lottery school that they're really excited about. Um, and sometimes students will come in with four or five. And, and what we do is we prioritize as we go through the process. And so some of the weeding out of schools happens as they have to do the work. So in this particular list, having UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis, and Cal Poly, um, that's totally fine for the REACH category because all the UCs are on the same application. So there's not a whole lot of extra work that's going in there and Cal Poly is not even requiring an essay. So to, to me, this is totally fine that the student has four and they probably could have had another one if they wanted to, but we're also trying to base it off of how much work does the student up for and what are they excited about. Um, and then um, USC um, at 16% acceptance rate ended up in the lottery category. And again, a lot of students might have two or three in this category, but we're certainly, when we go through the process, not always gonna prioritize lottery schools um, because students only have a certain amount of energy to put towards this process. And we wanna make sure that they're really solid in their targets, their likelies, and their reaches. 
So in addition, after we kind of looked at the balancing by a target reach, likely all of that good stuff, um, then Roxana and I, actually this is Roxana's trick that I love, um, she takes her students and, and says, says, okay, here's California, here's out of state, here's likely target reach and lottery. Let's draw a graph and make sure we're okay with missing maybe some target out of state or reach out of state or lottery out of state just to make sure that the breakdown is okay. As I said previously to this, his, uh, my student's goal was to um, stay in California. And so that looked pretty balanced to him because he was hoping to stay in California. But if there's students who are thinking they want to go, you know, all over the United States, then we would just make sure that um, there was at least one likely in California in case they change their mind um, and that it's balanced by location and selectivity. So another way that we talk with students about balancing is public and private schools. Now, there's some students who really only want to be looking at public schools. And, um, and that's fine. The reason we draw these boxes is to make sure when they look at it, they feel comfortable. So in this particular case, um, the breakdown actually is, you know, we keep the California and out of California and, um, and a balance of public and private within California. Um, you know, I have a rule with my students, um, I think Jenny, probably does this as well, um, is that I, they need to have one school in California on their list. Um, that's just because priorities change, things happen. I always want to make sure that students have an option in California if that's what they want. Um, the other thing that I strongly encourage for students is that they have at least one private school. Um, just one place where it's slightly smaller, just in case. Um, and so when I see this and, and kind of looking at it, we know that the student really, you know, wants to stay in state. So my question to the student would be, okay, you don't have any out of California privates, do you care? And I'm pretty sure that the student doesn't care. So it's fine to have empty boxes. Um, when we do these exercises, it's not so that we fill in all the boxes. That's not the point. It's to just visualize for students and making sure that they're feeling comfortable, that their list is balanced between public and private for them. What feels good to them? We don't have any hard and fast rules. And also um, inside of California, outside of California. Um, and one that we, um, we didn't do would also be like, you could do an entire graph about finances, right? And have different bandwidths of what the um, estimated costs are. And then you could balance out, you know, $30,000 or less, you know, 30 to 50, 50 plus. Um, and again, that's another way to be looking at this process and to be balancing in a different way. So last but not least was the admissions results, right? We looked and the student, we'll start with where um, he wasn't accepted. Um, you know, Cal Poly, he was a reach and he was waitlisted at Cal Poly. And then UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis, and UC USC were all uh, not accepted. They were all in the reach level, right? Um, however, if you look over to the left where he was accepted, he has a lot of options, right? He received money from University of Oregon, um, was accepted to San Jose State, San Diego State, UC Santa Cruz, Chapman, and Loyola Marymount. And one thing that I think was nice too was that he was accepted to larger schools and also smaller schools. So he had another option in terms of that. So if his priorities changed over senior year, at first you think, I'm going to go to this big school, it's going to be amazing. And then once you finish, you think, oh, maybe. I don't want to keep fighting like I've been, you know, <laughs> been trying to get the courses and things like that, um, that maybe Chapman or Loyola Marymount would have been better fits for him. But in the end, he ended up choosing um, San Diego State. Um, he was invited to the Honors College, but decided not to apply to it and is perfectly happy there. 
So um, that's kind of how our admissions results played out. And while it, it, it's hard that he didn't get into any of his reach schools, and I'm sure, you know, one of the UCs or Cal Poly would have been um, an excellent choice for him. I think the way that we did our college research and that they all kind of had overlapping features and looking back at what his college values are, the places where he was accepted had all of the things that he wanted. So um, we were excited about that. So essentially the things that we've covered tonight, um, we started out with sort of thinking about what's important to colleges. Um, then we kind of showed you the numbers that we can gather um, to help us kind of, you know, balance lists in terms of acceptance rates, SAT, and GPA. Um, we also talked about other factors, things that we can't control or things that we're just not gonna know in terms of going through the process. Um, then we sort of gave you an idea of, um, you know, likely target reach and lottery and thinking about, you know, the likely is one to three, the target is four to five, the reach is one to three, and then um, the lottery one to two. Um, I would say that as a general rule, kids, you know, usually are able to complete and do a really good job on um, 10, maybe 12 applications. Um, that's usually where they end up, even if their list started out at 17, um, like this particular students did. Um, that's about what they have the bandwidth for in terms of completing the process. Um, but that is also the important part of balancing in a lot of different ways, that there's the academic piece. Um, you, you have to determine also what's really important as a family um, and as a student, which is a lot of what we're talking to students about this time of year. Um, the academic, you know, the social and all of the different types of fit. We have actually a whole webinar on that. And then there's these different types of balance, you know, thinking about location, thinking about in-state, out-of-state, public, private. It, cost, um, all of these things are really important to be looking at to make sure, making sure that students feel that their list is balanced overall. You know, when I was working at Challenge Success, I was working with a high school um, that was really trying to, you know, reframe the college process. And one of the things that they came up with, which I thought was such a beautiful thing to kind of summarize um, the admissions process, is that you can only go to one. Mm -hmm. Right. So when a family might look at this list and say, oh, you know, he didn't get into any of his reaches and any of that. But the idea is that a student can only go to one. And if we balance the list and done the research on the front end, they're going to have a lot of really good choices. And in this particular case, the student had six choices, some of which included scholarships and an honors college. Um, we also tell students, and this is the one that they always forget that we tell them mm -hmm. until later, which is if you do not get rejected from a college during this process, we didn't do it right. Um, that part of this process is about reaching for what might, you know, what your, you know, best possible option might be. And we're not gonna sit and tell you that it's going to happen, but you absolutely, if, want them to try. Um, and the idea is we didn't shoot high enough if a student gets to every, gets into every school on their list. And so I always want students to internalize that because getting rejection, you know, letters is not fun, but it's just part of the process. And that's part of the balance of the list. That's why we have likelies where we, you know, we're pretty sure things are going to come and they're going to say, yay, we want you here. And that's why we have reaches in lottery schools too. So thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to take a moment to stop the recording, um, and then we'll stick around for a couple more minutes um, for um, anyone who has specific questions. You'll just have to turn on. Um, you'll have to unmute yourself. So thank you so much.